from 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, we will read this chapter together. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's been a beautiful Mother's Day and um, so thankful that you're out for the evening service. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> Paul makes quite a few declarations, and so that's what we just look at those, and uh, you'll see them all through the chapter. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing um, and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto uh, Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry." And Tychicus, have I sent to Ephesus the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus when thou comest? I bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge." Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every, every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute uh, Prisca and Aquila, and the household of Anisiphorus, Erastus, abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Militum sick, do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Paul's declarations, you'll see them. Verse 1, I charge thee. Verse 6, I am ready. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Verse 16, I pray. Verse 17, I was delivered. First of all, Paul does some preaching to preachers, and he says, I charge thee. I charge thee to preach the word. Now, you may not be a, a preacher, but I must preach to my own self and any other ministers present or listening. Uh, we have an obligation to preach the word. I've heard some preach their notions. I've heard others ignore tough portions. But to keep my conscience clear, I must preach the word. Paul said, I charge thee to preach, to be instant in season and out of season. Simply means be urgent. Preach the word when it's popular and when it's not. Now, they told me that um, protesters were going to come to various churches across America. They, somebody said they were ready if they came. I was sure hoping they would come. It would really help our attendance. Uh, we did have a good crowd this morning, 453 or 457, tremendous. But if the protesters had come, it could have put us right up over 500. Please spread the word. We are open to any protests. We're thrilled to have them. Solomon's saying, oh, no, but I want them because I think it'd be exciting. Uh, we're in a battle, and, and I don't care uh, about what they think. We're going to still be pro-life. We're not into politics, but we are into this word. And if our church can't preach pro-life and pro-family and anti this uh, gender mess and all of that, we don't have any business even opening the doors. Uh, we have to preach when it's in season and out of season. Reprove and rebuke. 
Adam Clark said that actually means that the preacher is supposed to stand and reprove cuttingly and severely those who will not abandon their sin. Now, is there joy in that for a preacher? No. Believe me. God has given the minister the most enjoyable, rewarding, and blessed job, and yet God has given the minister the most terrible, heart-wrenching job. Ask Dan Stetler, who preached at the IHC this year on a Wednesday night. I don't know if you heard, how many heard that message on Wednesday night? Powerful message. God laid a burden on his heart, and he preached, and he's been tore up about it ever since by people in our own movement who don't like anybody to say anything about anything that they're doing wrong. The only difference I thought of just recently, I thought about, uh, you know, Dan Stetler's no different than I remember him as a kid. I first heard him at a Penview commencement. He preached a powerful message. The only difference is that if Brother Stetler had preached that years ago, the preachers would have been in the aisle shouting and praising God and backing him. But the sad state of 2022 where our own preachers will cut and divide anybody who preaches the truth. I charge thee to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's our obligation as ministers to give rational, biblical, doctrinal truth and to present it, yes, with rebuke and reproving, but also with long suffering, patiently teaching the slow learner in the faith. Paul has preached to the preachers in verse 1 and 2 because of the type of layman that will be found in the last days. Verses 3 and 4, we find a description of end times, lukewarm layman, of whom we don't have here. We have wonderful laymen. And if one or two slipped in the door, take warning. The kind of people that some pastors pastor. Um, the time will come, the Bible says, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into fables. I found those verses interesting. I've heard them all my life. Did a little study to figure out what all it means. Uh, Adam Clark said, um, they'll not hear the practical truths of the gospel. That's when you get right down to where we live. Uh, you know, when you get right down to the choices that we make every day that involve where we go, what we do, how we look, our attitudes, forgiveness, all of those things, where we live, the practical things, uh, they prefer speculative opinions which either do no good to the soul or corrupt and destroy it. They will add one teacher to another, run and gad about after all to find out those who insist not on the necessity of bearing the cross of being crucified to the world and of having the mind that was in Jesus. They have itching ears, endless curiosity. They get their ears tickled with the language and accent of the person, abandoning the good and faithful preacher for the fine speaker. Adam Clark said the truth strips them of their vices, sacrifices their idols, darts its lightnings, against their easily besetting sins and absolutely requires conformity to the crucified Christ. Therefore, they turn their ears away from it and believe any kind of stuff and nonsense. I charge thee. And then in verse 6, he says, I am ready. I am ready. The time of my departure is at hand. I am ready. There are many things we could testify to and about. Uh, but if this Sunday night you can come to church and simply say, I am ready. I'm ready for a departure if it should be me. Um, I am ready. It's a wonderful testimony. The problem with too many, they're not ready. They're living in a late hour, not ready. In a desperate, even if this is not late, we don't know when Jesus will come back. None of us can predict. But we do know that even if this is not the latest hour, it is a desperate hour. And um, when the trumpet sounds and the holy magnet of heaven draws the saints from this sin-cursed world, so many will not go up because they have too many weights. 
around their feet. Weights of sin, disobedience against the known will of God, weights of worldliness or lukewarmness, weights of unforgiveness or bitterness, weights of unmade restitution, weights that drag us down and will keep us down at the last trump, weights, all kind of weights sitting at the ankles, around the hearts, in the average pew of America. And we have sweep it under the rug if the preacher mentions it or God forget, forbid approaches us about it. We act like God doesn't care, God doesn't get it, or it's some great grandfather in the sky who will somehow overlook us. We have a special agreement with him, special little understanding. You know, God is love, of course. But the laws of sin were set by God and man long ago. No sin is going up in the rapture. Beautiful scene uh, today. This has been a great day here at Beavertown Church. I love to come to church. I kind of like our people. And, um, and this is just a great place. I love to be here. But what if? What if Jesus would come before I get done with this message? What if Jesus would come? Would there be someone here, this section, this one, this one, this one, that um, you'd still be here? So many seats would be empty. I hope all of them. I hope this would be an empty place if Jesus came back. But there may be someone who'd be weighted down, sitting here as pretty as when you came in, but weighted down with unforgiveness or carnality or sin or unmade restitution. You know, on second thought, if Jesus came back and you were left behind, you wouldn't be sitting there. Uh, I'm sure this altar would be open and there would be no need to sing a hymn or to uh, preach another sermon to get people to the altar if Jesus came back and you were left behind. In that moment, the weights would seem so silly. And the reasons, every one that I've ever dealt with that went back spiritually or were not serving the Lord, who knew better, they have a reason. They will tell you about, for some I've tried too many times, or, but for many it's maybe someone that's disappointed them. Someone who's hurt them in the church. I mean, I guess we all have a catalog like that of people who have hurt us in the church. I've had people hurt me at Walmart. They cut in line. But it seems like in the church, especially the devil wants to take it. Did you hear what they said? Do you think, what do you think they meant? You know, and the devil just builds on that. And little things, you know, little wedges between people. I don't know if you're here tonight, you're not where you ought to be spiritually. I don't know what you're thinking about right now. But I know this much, if we miss it, whatever it is will seem very small, no matter how big it is. The Apostle Paul had the kind of testimony that we must all have. I am ready. Amen? Amen? Verse 7, he said, I have fought a good fight. I like that. Did he win every battle? Did every person he preached to get saved? No. Did everybody like Paul? No. Was it always easy? No. Did he drive a brand new Cadillac to every revival? No. Did he have the latest in clothes and appliances and gadgets? No. Did Paul always shout and feel on top? No. But he still fought. And he said, I fought a good fight. And so we need to understand that it's not a playground. Uh, others may be blessed, but you may not right now. You may be going through something, but we're not giving up on God. Tomorrow at work, when the same old thing happens, and it's so frustrating, but we're not going to give up on God. When children are wounding our heart on Mother's Day, we're not going to give up on God. He fought a good fight. This is not the way of the moment. 
it's, um, it's, it's not a coward's way. It's the way of character, discipline, and principle. We're in this for the long haul. Amen? Amen. We're in this for the long haul. It's a fight. And by the grace of God, I intend to fight a good fight. It may not be as good as you, the strongest, the first, but I want to do my best. may not be able to do the job that someone else is doing, but I'm going to do what God's called me to do. may not be able to sing like somebody else. Sure can't preach like somebody else, but I'm going to keep fighting and sweating and laboring. I just like that. I have fought a good fight. Amen? And he said, I have finished my course. Now, as far as we know, none of us have finished our course. We're all here. But, um, but, but we do have to have that determined. Paul was coming to the end of things. And he said, I'm finishing. I finished my course. I settled things um, years ago now to go God's direction for my life. But May the 8th, 2022, it's still settled, and it's got to be still settled for you. Amen? Um, God's, by God's grace, when I lay my armor down, when Jesus comes back, or when they bury me in yonder hill, I want that testimony, I have finished my course. I believe God has a plan and purpose for every life. You're a promise, the songwriter said. You're a possibility. You have potential. But there is something that God wants you to do and something God wants you to be. And how dare we just put off our duties and responsibilities. Across the years, I've been a little dogmatic, I guess, about, you know, it's not really acceptable to miss services. And it's not acceptable to just you know, float along. I'll never forget when Eric Coons was here, he had a Sunday school. He was the team, he was our first youth pastor and he was uh, in the Sunday school class. And I don't know for why, but he had everybody, all the kids write why they liked Beavertown Church. And one of them wrote, uh, our family really likes Beavertown Church because it's large enough that we don't have to do anything. <laughs> when I read that, I said, I quit. You may not feel like you're doing much, uh, but, you know, every little thing matters. Every little thing matters. And, and um, I, I want us to make sure we finish our course. I'm so impressed. I've watched here recently. There's just several people that are good people that I watch them hang around after church, and they watch for the person who's alone, and they try to encourage them, or someone who's new. Every one of us need to say, if there's someone alone, before or after a service, that constitutes an emergency. It's one of the biggest things we could all do, is just try to reach out. I don't want a bunch of loose ends and careless pages of service history. You know, my grandpa, uh, Plank, uh, John and I went up recently to the farm to get a couple of things, and we were looking through things. We, we, we picked up a U-Haul, actually, to get some of the things, and uh, it was at the place where Grandpa always got his vehicles. I didn't remember this. John has the memory of an elephant, but I don't remember anything. And he remembered this. Oh, this is where Grandpa and Grandma always got their cars, you know, and they were just very deliberate people. You know, I, can, I could picture them going in there, and, you know, they didn't even really bargain much. They probably got took an advantage, taken advantage of Whatever the guy said, that's what it cost. That's likely what they paid. And, um, uh, you know, they kept all the... They were one of these people. There's people like that here. Uh, but there's some of us that aren't like that. That, you know, the service record, every single page. I mean, every tire that was ever purchased, how much it was purchased for. Every time the tires were rotated. Every time the oil was changed. I guarantee you Charlie Leitzel's like that. Guarantee you. And he's had his car for 20 years, so he has an encyclopedia of service records on this vehicle. Every time you change the oil, you know, every time, every, you know. 
I'll have to tell you, I'm not real careful about stuff like that. I'm not. Whatever happens, happens. But when it comes to this Christian life, I don't want a bunch of loose ends and careless pages of service history. Sister Knapp spoke about it in her testimony tonight about the Lord rebuking her, chastising her, helping her. She's been serving the Lord a long time. Isn't that wonderful, that kind of testimony? I don't want a sparse record and a disappointing haphazard up and down report card from the skies. Maybe I won't be at the top of my class, but I will, by God's grace, be able to say, I have finished my course. I like the next, the next declaration. I have kept the faith, the most important testimony. We live in a disposable age, disposable flashlights, disposable contacts, disposable gloves, disposable masks. It's going to take 15 years for them to find all those masks cluttered along the road and in the parking lots. All kinds of things that people discard. And, um, and uh, you know, things that used to be always fixed. Your washing machine. You always fix your stove. You always fix this and that. But it's almost cheaper to buy a new one now. It's just disposable. And all kinds of things that people are discarding, but and with it, they're discarding their faith. We throw away our faith in people. We don't have confidence in anybody anymore. We throw away our confidence in the preacher. Some folk can't listen to anybody preach, and you don't have to like me, but we're going to soon have four preachers. I hope you'll like one of them, and if you don't like at least one of them, you might want to check the Limburger cheese that's on your own nose. It's always cracked me up across the years when we got up to three preachers, when somebody would get upset at all three preachers. Well, I'm telling you, I mean, I understand me, my, my, but Matt Malloy, I mean, he wouldn't hurt a flea. Solomon Schaefer, you know but he's still a good guy. You know what I'm saying? But there are people that can't hear anybody preach. They have something against everybody. They're about the only ones left in the church now. They're the only ones spiritual at all. You think that's not true, but it is true. We've had it here across the years. I've lived long enough to see it. When, when we, I mean, we're talking about now years ago, even in the old church, and we had some powerful services and great, old, some of the old timers were still with us and the prayer rooms were full and wonderful, you know, and we have all of good things now, but I'm saying it's not just, I'm not preaching to just now, I've watched this across the years. And I mean, we're talking about good people who were the real thing. And there were folks that couldn't find hardly anybody in the entire church they had confidence in. Well, I have good news for you. Not everybody has quit. Not everybody has turned back. Not everybody is going the way of Baal. There's not all the prophets are hiding in the caves. In an age of disposable faith, I think we ought to just say, my faith By his grace, my faith still holds unto the cross and unto the Christ of Calvary. And so you can say tonight, I have kept the faith. If you can't say that, get things worked out with you and the Lord and your fellow man. So that you can say, no matter what, I I don't understand everything, but I know this much. I want to keep the faith by his grace. Then Paul says, Verse 16, I pray. Now, now, Paul is the apostle, that great hero of the faith. We quote him, we study him, we read about him, read of him. He's the one who's preaching, testifying, boldly saying, I am ready. I have fought a good fight, finished my course, kept the faith. But he's admitting I must pray. He's actually praying over circumstances where people have hurt him, see. That's probably when we have to do the most praying when we feel the least like it, and to pray when people misunderstand us or hurt us. Oh, you see why he has to pray. Verses 10 through 16, verse 10, one of his co-laborers has backslidden, Demas has forsaken me. 
Oh, my. So there's nothing more discouraging. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did much evil. No wonder Paul in verse 16 prayed. But in verse 17, he said, I was delivered. That's a good declaration. I was delivered through the beatings, the misunderstandings, the backsliding of brethren, the evil of Alexander the coppersmith, through loneliness when all men forsook me. Verse 17, the Lord stood with me. The Lord strengthened me. I was delivered. And verse 18, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Three Hebrew children in a furnace fired seven times hotter, but they were delivered. Daniel in the dungeon with hungry lions, but he was delivered. Joseph in a prison in Egypt, but he was delivered. Esther and her people committed to certain death, but they were delivered. And so I don't know your furnace. I don't know your lion's den or your modern day predicament. But I do know that you can claim the promises of his word that there is deliverance. The Lord strengthened me. And that can be your testimony, your declaration in the midst of battle, shall we stand. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, we love you tonight. We thank you for your presence in both services today. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to serve you. And we make these declarations with Paul that we intend to keep the faith. We intend, we intend to, um, to serve thee all the days of our life and be what you would have us to be. We intend to, by thy grace and thy grace alone, and bring us back on Wednesday night. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. You're dismissed.